And then also as a reminder, we are having a two part series. So this is gonna be the first part today. And then we have another um, part of this webinar mm -hmm. slash training, whatever you wanna call it on Thursday. So if you haven't signed up for the Thursday one, go ahead and sign up for that one too. Um, and you get a chance to enter a raffle to win a Target gift card. So mm -hmm. you could potentially win two car Target gift cards. Um, so I love Target. So I, I would definitely enter if I were y'all. Um, so yeah, make sure to sign up for both of the days. Today, we're going to be going over more anatomy stuff. Um, and then to our Thursday, we're going to be going over birth control and STIs. So if you're more interested in birth control and STIs, you know, feel free to sign up for Thursday mm -hmm. as well. Um, so make sure that um, here's just kind of like housekeeping. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So if, um, you know, you don't, feel comfortable sharing. I mean, we're not sharing screens anyway. So just FYI, this webinar is being recorded. But if, um, you know, we want to get access to the recording, I'm pretty sure we can give access. Um, oh, yeah. And then there will be three winners for today and then three winners on Thursday. So make sure to look out in your email. And then that's how you can find out if you will um, get a if you do end up winning a gift card. And we are um, in partnership with the California School Based Health Alliance. Um, so yeah, we'll get we'll talk a little bit more about us. So my name is Jessica, and my coworker is. My name is Ashley and we both work at San Isidro Health and we'll talk a little more about what we specifically do within um, our realm at San Isidro Health as health educators at Teen Clinic. Yes. So again, um, me and Ashley's pronouns are both she, her and hers and we work at San Isidro Health um, Teen Clinic. So this is a clinic that's all the way in Southern San Diego. Um, so we did see somebody is, um, shout out to Casey, who said she's from Chilla Vista. Um, and sh we work at a clinic who that provides reproductive health services, reproductive health services. Um, so we work with people ages 12 to 29. Um, and we really, you know, talk about anything our services cover anything sexual health related. So all the way from birth control, condoms, STI testing, and pregnancy testing. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we have our first question. And it is, wait, can you see it, Ashley? Okay, yeah. Are California minors which, under the age of 18 allowed to receive a sexual health services without per parents' consent? What do y'all think, yes or no? Okay, we got two people saying yes. We got a few answers in the chat. All right, so the second question is, Question two will be showing in a bit. Are sexual health services free for California minors? And again, a reminder, um, the code is in the chat. It's also at the top of our, oh, it says time's up already. 
Okay. So we got eight people saying duh, two people saying I don't know. So the answer is yes for both of them. Youth can receive free and confidential services in the state of California. So we are very fortunate to live in a state that has um, pretty progressive um, laws for people and rights for people ages 18 and under. Unfortunately, not every state in the United States does, but we do. So how is this possible? So there's an insurance program called Family Pact. Um, and basically all you guys really need to know about it is that it covers sexual health services um, in California. So most youth actually qualify um, and you can sign up with it on with your information. So it doesn't, they do not ask, we do not ask anything about your parents' information at all. So it is completely confidential. Anyone can sign up for it regardless of their gender or immigration status. And you can sign up for it at your local family planning clinic. So you're probably thinking, how do I find a local family planning clinic? So we got y'all. So the, this is a really cool locator. Um, you can just type in your address or your zip code um, and it will point you to a clinic that will accept fam, um, family pact um, and that provides sexual health services. If this clinic of uh, this locator doesn't work for you or for your address for whatever reason, um, there's also a website called teensource.org. And I think Ashley will be able to um, also link that in the chat. So those are two really cool websites to um, to make sure or to resources for people to find the services that they need, especially young people. All right, and then lastly on them on our youth rights. So these are youth rights in California. Um, so minors 12 and up have the right to receive these services without their parents' consent. So that's pregnancy or any pregnancy related care and prevention, family planning service, which is basically pregnancy related care and prevention, um, sexual assault services and sexually transmitted diseases treatment and prevention. Um, note that there is some services that minors 12 and under have the right to receive um, without their parents consent, but it just depends which ones. But the important thing to take away is that everyone ages 12 and up is able to get these services um, confidentially without their parents' consent. And also one more thing to add, um, California law says that people in grades seven through 12 are legally allowed to leave school to um, attend a confidential reproductive health service appointment. Um, so by law, parents will not be notified or cannot be notified of this absence and the school shall not be held liable. So this is really important. And sometimes not every school knows or not every school is aware or they don't have a policy in place. So it's really important to talk to your nurse because she is or they are the person that will be the best at um, letting you know what the process is like at your specific school. So if you're not sure what the process is like at your specific school, I highly encourage you to talk to your school nurse. Um, and if there's a school-based center at your school already, you know, you can, I'm pretty sure you can just um, kind of get information from them and they'll be able to help you out and let you know a little bit more about what your school's policy is. But if you know that your school isn't letting people go to um, their reproductive health services appointment, please do um, like talk to your nurse, talk to whoever they need, there's, or talk to someone in the district because they, um, this law, um, most people in the district should know about it. So if they're not practicing it, it's really important for youth to advocate for themselves and to let their school district know that, hey, we know our rights and we want you, we want you to respect them. Um, so now we're gonna get uh, started with the anatomy part of the presentation. So Ashley is gonna take it away.
Yes. So in order to start off with talking about anatomy, we first have to go over, of course, consent. So this is a great little video. Um, just make sure in the chat, and I know um, some people's Mentimeters weren't working. Same thing with this video. If you can't hear it, let us know. We'll figure that out right away. Um, but we'll go ahead and play this for you first. So um, in the chat, just let us know right away if you can't hear it. And I can't hear it, so I don't think. Okay. And then um, someone else can't hear it, okay. Let's see, I think I have to stop sharing this screen, so I'll stop sharing. Mm -hmm. and then share with computer sound. Knock, knock. Who's there? Would you? Would you who? Would you enter someone's home without asking first? Then why wouldn't you ask for consent? Recent conversations around the Me Too movement have led many people to ask, what is consent? When to ask for it? And how to ask for it? Turns out, consent has more to it than you'd expect. And just like sex, you'll have to peel off some layers before you can properly have it. So, should we begin? What is consent? Sexual consent is a person deciding whether or not they want to do something sexually. Consent should be obtained in all kinds of situations, including asking for a number, asking them out, or any relationship involving contact from a kiss, to nudes, to sex, and everything in between. Consent could be verbal, which is a spoken agreement to engage in sexy time. Or it could be non-verbal, which is an unspoken but enthusiastic involvement in said sexy time. However, not explicitly asking for or receiving verbal consent can lead to serious misunderstandings, even sexual assault. It's important to respect everyone's personal space and right to their own bodies. So what's not consent? Let's clear this up. Clothing, not consent. Inviting gestures or aakhon ke ishare, not consent. A marriage certificate or any kind of established relationship, not consent. Consent is also not gendered or heteronormative. People of all genders and sexuality should feel comfortable saying no. What is the right way to get consent? The best way is to ask, politely yet firmly, and accept the answer you get. But there's more to it. They agreed to make out, but that doesn't mean you have consent for sex. It's best to clarify at every stage. They may have said yes a previous time, but consent isn't a 10-year visa. You have to ask every time, and it can be revoked any time. Leaned in for a kiss and not sure if you can? Don't assume, just ask. Consent should always be freely given. Say they were up for bedroom sex, but you suddenly had to move elsewhere. Consent means having all the information before saying yes. And if they're not in the mood and say no, respect their decision. It doesn't count if they feel pressured or obligated. There are many more scenarios where consent is required. The best way to figure it out is always to ask. To truly embrace consent, don't wait for a no to stop, but an enthusiastic yes to start. Consent is multi-layered and complicated, and lack of it can cause serious trauma. A culture of silence results in a culture of violence. Open conversations around consent need to be had from a young age. So communicate. Ask questions like, hey, do you like this? How are you feeling? Is this okay? Frequently. Because it's best not to jump to any conclusions before you jump into bed. Like a great person once said, Koi doubt mat rakna dil. Tell us your thoughts on consent in the comments below. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe to Vitamins 3. Thank you for sharing that, JB. So I hope you all enjoyed that little video, but just to elaborate, consent it should be freely given. It should have an enthusiastic yes, and it can be taken away at any moment. And just like she said, just because you're married, the clothes you wear, whatever it is, does not mean that it automatically gives that person consent just because you've done it before. And obviously, um, actually not obviously, this is something that we should definitely point out that if you're under any influence, that could honestly um, change the mindset you're in. So whether that's alcohol, drugs, um, just any sort of influence like that, you cannot give 
a, a consensual yes or an enthusiastic yes, because in that moment you may make decisions that you wouldn't normally make when sober. So now we can get into reproductive anatomy and physio. And like I said, if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. And then, but at the end, we do have anonymous questions. So the chat could be given to just panelists or if you're okay with everyone saying either or. So to start, we'll talk about intersex. So whenever we go into anatomy, the way we talk about it is a person with a penis and a person with a vagina, but we need to point out intersex. So when it comes to intersex, this is when sometimes babies are born, um, they have an internal or external sexual anatomy, chromosomes or hormones that don't fit that typical person with a penis, person with a vulva. So they don't fit into those exact categories. And like a really good example on the slide, a person might be born with a vulva on the outside, but may not have the typical internal, internal anatomy on the inside, so maybe a uterus. So missing those certain aspects or a person may be born with genitals that seem to be in between both. So really, really pointing out that every person kind of has their own um, sexual journey and that we all really aren't born the same. And one of these is really important to point out. And then, so first off, we'll start off with talking about a person with a penis and just a little heads up, because it's anatomy, we'll be showing some pictures like this. And like I said, if you have any questions or want us to elaborate a little more, we definitely can, but this is a basic. So we'll definitely get you like the gist of everything, but we can go very, very in depth if we need to. Um, but just to start off, this is a picture of a penis, but this is uncircumcised. So every person's genitals are unique. And when it comes to circumcision, I'll go into the rundown of what circumcision is and almost how to be more hygienic when it comes to if you are not circumcised, like this picture. So what is circumcision? It's a surgery where the foreskin is cut from the penis exposing the tip. So like in the picture before you saw it covered, in this picture, the tip is exposed. So circumcision can be performed for many reasons, whether it's cultural, religious, or just preference of some families. It's usually done at infancy, but people can choose to be circumcised later as an adult. When it comes to if you're uncircumcised, so you still have that foreskin, you do want to make sure that you are cleaning it a little more properly when it comes to hygiene. Make sure you really, really um, use as much as you can to clean around it. Don't just let it um, you know, think that it cleans itself because we'll talk about the vagina later, which does clean itself. But when it comes to a penis, you definitely want to make sure you clean it well and keep your hygiene good to go, especially when it comes to STIs and things we'll talk about on Thursday. All right. So now that we talked a little bit about circumcision, uh, we're gonna get into the actual body parts um, and what they mean. So um, as you can see here, there's about five numbers. We're not gonna really get right into like every single thing and what each one does, but basically each one of the numbers here, each one of the terms, they all have a special job or a special function um, on, and that's why they're on the body. So. We talked about the foreskin already, which is part of the um, part of the circumcision. Um, and then you can see number one says pubic hair. So every person who goes through puberty has pubic hair. Like that's just normal. Pubic hair is normal, no matter if it's on a penis, on a vulva, on anywhere, on their armpits, everyone has pubic hair, right? And some people choose to shave it, some people choose not to. It's really up to each person to decide what they want to do with their pubic hair. Um, and then we see number three, it says glands. So the glands is what we call the tip of the penis, which is actually the most sensitive part of the penis. Um, it has, I forget how many, but it has a lot of, of nerve endings. Basically, it means that it's a site of either extreme pleasure or extreme pain. Um, and then the scrotum, which is number four, is sort of in the back. 
Um, and basically the scrotum is for temper is a temperature regulator. So um, whenever someone is cold or whenever someone's hot, the scrotum will be the one regulating the temperature of the testicles. Um, and why do we wanna regulate the temperature of the testicles? Well, because inside of the testicles, we have really um, important um, cells that, are, have, um, that, that live there and those cells are called sperm. I actually have a little cute plushy sperm here that I wanted to share with y'all. So this is what um, a sperm would look like on the screen. And this is just a cute little um, plushie. So a sperm is what lives in the testicles. So if you see down here at the bottom, um, you can kind of see um, some uh, like a sort of a ball. So that's where um, the sperm will live at. And the sperm is actually what, um, it goes through a kind of journey. So let's say you're going on a road trip. I know here in San Diego, whenever we go to like a road trip to LA or something, like we take the 805 freeway, we go get gas first, then we go get snacks. And you know, we take the 805 all the way up to LA. It's the sperm is doing the same thing. They're taking the freeway and they're going on their journey to wherever they end up. So um, the sperm will, when a person is um, like having sex or they may be masturbating or whenever they're sexually aroused, um, they, uh, the sperm will eventually come out of the testicles um, and um, will ejaculate. So let me talk a little bit more about the sperm. So the sperm is what fertilizes an egg um, when it goes into a person with a vagina. It doesn't always fertilize an egg. It's only when a, it goes into um, a person's um, with a vagina's uh, system. So, um, and sperm, whenever a person first starts producing sperm is when they are um, starting puberty. So that's a little bit 101 on sperm. And then I'll let Ashley talk a little bit more about ejaculation. Yes. So sperm have a huge, huge deal when it comes to the reproductive system of a person with a penis. So like JB was saying, they have to go on that little road trip, make a couple stops in order to, you know, get where they need to go. So those stops all give the sperm nutrients, fluids, things like that to make the ejaculation actually occur. So when it comes to ejaculation, it's pretty much when that semen, so semen, and we'll talk about semen too, is when the sperm in the semen comes out of the erect penis. So there's usually about one to two teaspoons and most penises have an orgasm at the same time they ejaculate. So like JB was saying, whether it's sex, masturbation, either or, usually ejaculation occurs. And then, when we go into semen, this is, I think my favorite uh, fact I like telling youth whenever we teach is that one ejaculation, just one ejaculation contains between 200 to 500 million sperm. So it only takes one sperm <laughs> to fertilize one egg and in each ejaculation, there's 200 to 500 million. So just contained in that semen. So that is a huge, huge number. I always think that's so crazy. <laughs> Someone said, girl, don't scare me like that. And <laughs> it's so, don't worry, don't get scared. This is what we're here for, just teaching you. But yes, that is a real, real number. And semen, like I said, is the fluid that comes out of the penis during ejaculation. So it contains the sperm, it contains fluids, and all of those fluids on that little like road trip, like you, when you go on a road trip, you need gas, you need snacks in order for yourself to stay healthy, have a good day, um, and your trip well. Same thing with sperm. They have to make those stops to get the nutrients, get the fluids, and all those parts in the internal um, system really play a role. So the sperm will make stops in order to get those to have um, the semen and ejaculation occur. So that's why it's so important to know that little statistic right there. <laughs> yeah, and we definitely don't want to scare people. So 
there so please please join Thursday because we're going to be talking about birth control and how we can um, avoid the sperm from meeting the egg if people want to prevent pregnancy so there are ways to prevent pregnancy and to prevent the yes. sperm from meeting the egg mm -hmm. all right um, and then, so, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Ashley. <laughs> I was just going to say, moving on to the vulva, um, JV will go into more of the parts again, specifically, but just to show you external anatomy of a person with a vulva or a vagina. And like we said, every person's genitals are unique with the penis. There was, you could have foreskin, different sizes, same thing with a vulva, um, looks different different sizes, colors, all yada, yada. So black and white is the perfect little depiction of just a general picture to share with you all. Thank you, Ashley. And um, yeah, similar to the penis, you know, the vagina or the vulva. Um, so most people actually call it the vagina, but what we're gonna learn today is that the vagina is actually um, number eight, which is the little hole that you see here. So the vagina is actually internal. The vulva is what we think of as like the outside. So most people call it the vagina when in reality it's, it's, it's the vulva. Um, and I, I was gonna say previously when I was comparing it to the penis, it also has um, pubic hair. So, you know, like I said before, every person has pubic hair. Every person that's gone through puberty does. Um, some people choose to shave it. Some people wax it. Some people laser it. Um, so it's really up to everyone to decide um, what they want to do with their body hair. Um, and again, we're not really going to go much into each one, but just the few things that I wanted to point out is definitely the difference between vagina and vulva. And also I want to talk a little bit more about number six, which is the clitoris. So a lot of times people don't really know where the clitoris is at, don't really talk about the clitoris. Um, so one thing that I wanted to mention is that the clitoris, um, similar to the glands um, in the penis is an area of, is the most sensitive area in the vagina. So on the vulva, see, I caught myself calling it the vagina too, <laughs> um, on the vulva. So it is an area of either extreme pleasure or extreme pain. So, you know, because we live in a society that doesn't always appreciate women's sexuality, we're kind of, or people with a vulva, their sexuality, um, we're kind of, um, people forget about pleasure when it comes to the vulva. But in fact, the vulva also has a function that is literally just there for pleasure. Like there's no other function for the clitoris other than pleasure. Um, so that's, um, I wanna talk about that. And then the urethra, which, so there's actually, yeah, so there's actually two holes that you see on here, which is the urethra, which is seven. That's where urine comes out of. Um, and then you see the vagina, which that is where um, menstrual blood comes out of. Um, and that is where typically a tampon would also go inside. Or if a person's having penetrative sex, that's where a, um, a sex toy or a penis will go inside. Um, and then it's not shown here, but then there's also a third hole, which is the anus. Um, and that's typically where um, like poop comes out of, but sometimes people um, also have penetrative sex um, with the anus. Um, so yeah, um, if someone is having penetrative sex with the anus, um, we really recommend them not to um, kind of go back and forth between the vagina and the anus because then that's just going to cause an infection and we really wanna avoid that. Um, also, if a person is going to the bathroom, we recommend them cleaning from the front to the back. So um, making sure we're not getting that bacteria from the poop inside of the vagina because the vagina is really sensitive, okay? It's one of the most sensitive organs in the bodies and anything can throw off the vagina and cause a yeast infection, a UTI, all of those things. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the internal organs um, of the, um, like the uterus and all of that. So this picture right here um, to the right is gonna be what we call a uterus. Um, and then it's gonna be inside of like the stomach area, 
kind of like right above um, like your or like where your belly button is at, I guess. Um, and the inside of the, or with the uterus, there's two um, ovaries. So the ovaries is actually where um, the eggs are at, which is again, what produces a half of what produces a pregnancy. So I had a sperm plushie and I also have an egg plushie. So this is an egg. So when a sperm and an egg meet, that is when um, a zygote, which is, this um, will then implant into the uterus and cause a potential pregnancy. So the eggs, um, all you need to know about the eggs is that one of them, one of them releases each month. Um, so that's what we call ovulation. So um, when one of them releases, that is when um, a person is at the most, um, they have more potential for a pregnancy. Um, so each month a person releases, that is going through puberty, um, they release an egg each month. Um, yeah, so um, Ashley will talk a little bit more about eggs and then a little bit more about the rest of the internal, internal reproductive system. Yes, when it comes to a person with a penis, sperm is like the main, you know, sex cell when it comes to them, but also a person with a vulva, we're talking about eggs. So that's where the sperm and egg, one we'll talk about like birth control and STIs on Thursday. That's where the birth control condoms really come into play to prevent the egg, the fertilization all from occurring. So eggs, like JB was saying, are in the ovaries. Um, there, if there is a sperm, turn into the zygote, but they fertilize in the uterus. So they'll attach an implant and on the little lining on the side. So implantation, make a little home for itself. So that's why the uterus is so important for pregnancy occurring. And then the fallopian tube. So they almost look like little hands, like stretched out almost like two hands and arms. This is the passageway where the egg reaches the uterus. So literally from those ovaries travels almost like the sperm travel within the internal reproductive system um, in the organs. Same thing with the eggs. They have a little way they travel to and that's through the fallopian tubes. So if there is sperm um, and the sperm is introduced, this is where the egg will typically meet the sperm. So in those little um, arms per se. And this is like we said, the internal view. So right, I think JB, you, you can kind of roll the mouse around the uterus and then the cervix is what pretty much um, is the end part of the vaginal canal. And all below that is the vaginal canal. So you can see that right there. And then that would be the entrance of the vagina, which would lead to the whole outside of the vulva. So, so many things going on um, in our bodies that you know have all their functions, which is really, really cool at the same time. And then definitely important to talk about vaginal discharge. So JB mentioned this before, and I think I did too, how, you know, the vagina is a very sensitive, complex place, and it really does clean itself. So discharge refers to the secretions from the vagina. It helps keep the vagina clean and free of any harmful bacteria. So like even when JB was saying wipe from the front to the back, we want to make sure there's bacteria that doesn't get into the vagina. And this helps maintain a healthy balance. So when it comes to like a pH acid balance, you want to make sure your vagina stays at that healthy balance. But the way it stays at that healthy balance is because it cleans itself. So we always, always say, even like when it comes to hygiene of a person with a penis and say they weren't circumcised, how we're saying you have to be extra careful when you clean. It's kind of the opposite when it comes to the vagina. You really don't need extra, um, extra, what is it? Like products that you see like, oh, for your vagina, get rid of the odor, like use this to clean yourself. No, that is something that could definitely mess with the pH balance in your vagina. So the discharge varies greatly in scent, color, consistency, depending on where someone is during their menstrual, menstrual cycle. So just know that not all discharge is bad discharge. Like 
there is discharge is normal. Um, and of course, there is an aspect of discharge where if it smells different than you're used to, if it's happening a lot, that's when you can kind of be like, okay, wait, I think something's off. If something feels different, that could easily be, you know, a UTI or um, something a little more serious than that. So that's where you definitely want to get it checked, especially if it's irritating you. And because the vagina is self-cleaning, like I said, there's no need for douching or washing the vagina out or using any sprays that can be irritating. So definitely, definitely important to know and point out. And we just got a question, what is squirting? And that is the perfect intro to the next little aspect, aside yes. from vaginal discharge, <laughs> vaginal fluids. Yes, thank you. Actually, I was just going to say that too. So we actually... Um, we're going to talk about what squirting is or what va vaginal fluids are. So different than discharge. So discharge is totally different. Vaginal fluids is when someone is sexually excited and the vagina will become lubricated or otherwise known as wet. I'm pretty sure we've all heard of WAP already. So we're all like, what is that? What does that mean? Um, so it can be painful or irritating if the vagina does not have enough lubrication um, when engaging in any type of penetration. So if a finger goes up there, a penis, a sex toy, or anything goes up the vagina, it can be painful if it, there's not enough lubrication or what we know as if it doesn't get wet. Um, lubric we, there is lubrication um, like products that can, that there is in the stores that they sell, but usually the vagina by itself produces natural lubrication. And that's what people call it as like being a wop or a wet, or being wet. Um, so one in 10 vagina owners sometimes ejaculate. So um, this is actually what squirting would be. Um, so I, actually that's so funny that you asked that because I was just looking at an article um, talking about squirting and how it's still kind of like a subject where they haven't done that much research in. Um, but what we do know is that it usually occurs when a person is um, engaging or like in any type of sexual activity. Um, and when they ejaculate, uh, when a person with a vulva ejaculates, not, not for everyone, but for some people with a vulva, um, they might kind of literally squirt um, kind of a clear fluid. Um, and some people debate whether it's pee or whether it's like actual uh, or like in another type of fluid because it goes through, it releases through the urethra. Um, so um, yeah, there's still a little bit more research to be done exactly on that, but we do know that it happens and we do know that people with vulvas are also, also ejaculate just like people with penises. So thank you for asking that, Casey. Um, so this is just a quote that um, we thought was really cool because we, we've been talking really technical about like all these terms, like this is what a testicle does, this is what an ovary does. But at the end of the day, whenever um, someone is ready to have sex, um, you know, this quote really kind of explains it well, how sex is mostly between your ears, not your legs, the largest most important and most active sexual organ of the body is in a penis or a vagina, it's the brain. So we just thought it would be kind of cool to add that in there. Um, and this is just um, kind of a, if you wanna get more in contact with us um, or if you would like to um, get, not to get to know us more, but to, to like ask us more questions, feel free to follow us. Um, we have our Instagram on here, which is SYH Teen Clinic. We don't really use Snapchat anymore. So I wouldn't recommend following us on Snapchat. Um, this is our address. If anybody here is from San Diego um, or if you know anyone from San Diego. Um, and then this is our confidential text line. Feel free to text um, with any questions. And then also shout out to our sexual health advisory board, which is a group of um, interns, young interns at our clinic who are doing a great job of um, advocating for sexual health and just advocating for youth in general. 
So if you're like, I don't want to listen to what these adults got to say about sexual health, like what do they know? Follow them. They know what they're talking about. Um, and I know we do have some shababies in the house. So shout out to y'all. Um, and now we're going to move forward to the portion of our presentation where we're going to open it up to you all to um, answer any questions that you may have, anything that we didn't really get into. Like Ashley said in the beginning, we kind of just went over all like a general idea. We can definitely get into like specific things um, about other specific things. So please, please let us know if you have any questions, write it in, in this. Again, the code should be on here. Um, so you just go to menti.com and type in the code, or you can also just write the, your questions down in the chat if you would like to personally um, ask a question to either me or Ashley, um, you, can, you can personally DM us on here on Zoom. And um, like JB was saying, if anything like wasn't covered that you wanna know, I also have like another PowerPoint like pulled up of like other pictures we can show you of like other things since we just kind of kept it basics for the sake of time. So if you want to learn more about other parts, just let me know and we can get into it. All right, so we're getting questions and then I also see um, that there's questions in the chat and also wanted to remind y'all that um, if anybody's going to like head out before, um, like after this, please, please sign up for it Thursday, which we'll talk about birth control and STIs more in depth if you're more interested in that. And again, a reminder that there is going to be three raffle winners for today and three raffle winners for winners for Thursday. Okay, so I see the question in the chat says, is it normal to get your period at eight? Yes, it's totally normal. And the thing with um, sexual health, nothing is normal. So it, it's not normal because nothing is normal. Like people can get their periods at age 16. Some people start getting their periods at age eight. Um, there's still be there's still research being done because there is kind of we are seeing a decrease in ages of when people start their period. But you know, it, it's totally normal. And it, there's nothing like wrong with starting your period early. There's nothing um, like crazy. Um, and this is exactly why we need more sex ed in the schools as you know, people, some people are getting their periods earlier than other people and they need to know um, like how to take care of themselves, how to take, how to use a tampon, how to use a, a pad, um, all of those things. Um, I can answer another question from the anonymous questions. What does it mean to have an Audi vagina? So I'm actually not even sure what um, an Audi vagina means. So if it comes to maybe how it looks different or things like that, or um, we didn't really go into like lips. So like I said, there's different lip sizes when it comes to the mons um, pubis. There's a labia. I'm just seeing now I'm using terms labia majora and labia minora. So those are all um, referring to your outer lips and your inner lips. So like I said, vaginas are different colors, different sizes, lips show, lips don't show. And um, to kill two birds with one stone, um, the in the question about why is scent promoted so much in the media, perfumey vaginas, et cetera, society, society selling things to girls, same things when it comes to the scent, um, even how vaginas look, that is promoted in a certain way to girls and media. So a lot of people may not realize that you can have surgeries to make your vagina look a certain way. And if you're watching porn, if you see models and you're like, oh, they are so, they have just a perfect tiny little, it could be normal for some people, but it could be not for a lot of others. So really what you're seeing in the media is what they want you to see and how they want want it to look to you for a certain reason. So when it comes to vaginas, all different shapes of colors, sizes, same with penises, really, really different. 
JB, I can let you take another question. Yeah. Um, so another question in the chat was about consent and how to kind of establish consent at the beginning of relationships. So yeah, this is super important. And I'm glad that you're thinking about um, consent at the beginning. Um, but we also want to like make sure that it's not just at the beginning. I feel like sometimes it might um, feel kind of pressure. Oh, I'm just going to ask for consent at the beginning. Um, and then that's, that's why you kind of build that pressure. But if it's something that's being like normally talked about throughout the relationship, not just at the beginning, then it kind of takes away that like, how am I going to ask? Am I going to make this awkward? You know, it kind of normalizes it a bit more if it's like an ongoing conversation. Um, and, you know, it really just, it can be as simple as just asking someone, do you like this? Do you want me to keep going? Um, what What do you like? What do you want to do? You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be as, I know every time I go into a classroom um, and I ask people about consent or we're talking about it, people will say, oh, but it's just so weird. Like how are, it's going to ruin the moment. You know, if it's, it, it, it won't ruin the moment if the person cares about you. So if the person cares about what you're feeling, then I'm then I'm pretty sure they're going to be thankful and grateful that you brought it up and that um, it's being uh, it's a subject that's being talked about. So I'd say just bring it up as casual as you can. Just you know, uh, say hey, what do you like? Do you do you like this? Does this feel good for you? What feels good for you? Just like questions like that to kind of take away the pressure of like asking really like weird more not weird questions but just like questions that have a little bit more pressure behind them like do you want to have sex with me I mean it, I guess for some people it kind of can feel weird um, or they can kind of feel pressure to ask um, that question so if people ask you know questions other types of questions that kind of mean the same thing um, then then it can kind of take the pressure away um, yeah, that was, Ashley, did you want to answer another question? Yes, I'm like typing some more things in the oh. chat. So if you see, <laughs> um, so Adrian, I just answered yours about period sex. Um, I kind of said how it was totally up to your preference, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you would get an infection from period sex. Um, for some people, it just may be a little more uncomfortable but I was talking about how period peeing after sex really helps prevent any infection. So that's always a good habit to get into. And also for the peeing part, is this okay? After masturbating, I suddenly have the urge to pee. So like I said, peeing actually is a great, great habit to get into, um, especially when it comes to either masturbation after sex, just kind of cleaning out any bacteria. If um, say for the period sex, if you do feel irritated after you have period sex, that could be a sign that, you know, maybe your vagina isn't so comfortable with that. When it comes to masturbating, that's actually, if you have a penis or a vagina, um, cleaning out the bacteria, but also, especially if you have a penis, if you pee after masturbating, that's really, really good to clean out any sperm that could still be left on, um, the tip or still be in the area. And of course, Sperm can't last that long outside of the body, but you want to make sure if you do have sex right after that, that there and it's unprotected, so you're not wearing a condom, that you make sure you pee before. <laughs> um, does anything happen during same gender sex? So when it comes to same gender sex, it's almost the same, the way we talk about sex in general is we talk about oral vaginal, anal, penetrative sex. So when it comes to same gender sex, they can still have pretty much any of the sex that um, heterosexual couples may have. So when it comes to penetrative sex, they just may use maybe sex toys, fingers, things like that. But um, even when it comes to anal sex, same thing. But same thing with heterosexual couples, arousal, the fluids, um, those are all still present. So um, when it comes to pretty much like the parts we talked about of like the tip of the penis or the clitoris, those can all still be aroused, aroused even with the same gender sex. So, and there's actually um, same thing with condoms. You still use all the same things to protect yourself. 
just when it comes to pregnancy, that's less of a worry when you think about um, the sperm and the egg meeting, if that's not happening within the same sender, same sex couple, then, or um, partner, whoever it is, doesn't even have to be a couple. Um, that's just less of the worry. Um, I can answer the one, this one that says, what disease or infection are most likely transmittable through oral sex? And what is the best way to avoid them or stay uh, clean? Um, so the infections that are most likely transmittable um, through oral sex are the ones that live in the throat. So the ones that live in the throat are actually chlamydia and gonorrhea or can live in the throat. They can also live in other parts of the body. Um, so we'll get more into STIs um, on Thursday, but basically, yeah, chlamydia and gonorrhea are the two that can live in the throat. Um, and the best way to avoid um, STIs in general um, is, you know, using protection. So using condoms, using barrier methods. Um, if you're worried about oral intercourse, using um, maybe a dental dam. So we'll talk a little bit more about what dental dams are next um, next time. But dental dams are basically a latex barrier um, that goes on the vulva that can protect against STIs. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and also just a little, um, I know you I know you probably don't mean it in like a mean way, but we kind of really want to stay away from using words like staying clean when it comes to mm -hmm. STIs, because having an STI is extremely, extremely common, like mm -hmm. more than half of the population that's sexually active will eventually have an STI in their lifetime. So um, we kind of want to stay away from like stigmatizing STIs, but I know like this is something that we've heard all of our lives, like staying clean um, or being dirty if you have an STI. But as sex educators, we really um, want to kind of destigmatize that um, and kind of let people and let people know and educate them that STIs are normal and um, they're not anything like dirty. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the what if semen goes into my eyes. Um, so if semen goes into your eyes, I would really recommend to wash it out as quickly as possible. Um, unfortunately, eyes are like an opening to your body, so it probably wouldn't happen, but it can be, if it does happen, there can be a possibility for um, STD since um, STDs usually, um, when, whenever there's like an opening, that's where they can um, kind of go into. Um, so yeah, um, it usually doesn't happen, but it, it's like a one in a million chance that it would happen. But if it does, if it does happen, it's really rare that it would happen. These were great questions. Yeah. Yeah, these are super good questions. Thank you everyone for, answer, for asking questions. Um, we definitely enjoyed answering them. So oh, like yeah. Elizabeth, yeah, like Elizabeth mm -hmm. saying, um, there might be a short little survey that pops up or there will be, so make sure you fill it out. Um, if you just want more events like this, Make sure like to follow us, like we're saying, uh, if you wanna connect with me or JB, but also you will have an opportunity Thursday. And if you have other commitments, um, but you can still pop on like a little later, feel free to. Like we said, it's gonna be birth control and STI. So it should be really, really fun things. And I know we wanna be respectful for your time because you are all young and probably on Zoom way too often now. So we don't wanna take over too much of your time. Oh, the phone number in the chat? Yes, we can. Did you want, we'll do the teen clinic phone number. Yeah, is it the teen clinic one? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, the one you can text your call. Yes, we can add that in. So it's 619-800. 8336. And then I'm going to send it. Oh, <laughs> oh perfect. You got double the numbers. All 
All right, so it is about to be 5.30. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Don't forget to join us on Thursday. If you are not already signed up, um, you can sign up using the link that was provided by Elizabeth um, in the chat. And we look forward to continuing this conversation on Thursday and hopefully getting a little bit more into birth control and STIs. And I think our emails are on the, this slide coming up. So oh, yeah. if you want to email us too, True. You can definitely reach out to us. So Elizabeth mm -hmm. put this together. Um, so we're so thankful for that. And then me and JB's emails are right there. So if you want another way to contact us personally, even with questions or whatever it is you need, feel free to contact us. Um, or if you need those links for the health centers near you, just remember Teen Source and um, the locator we put in the beginning with the California State Health Alliance. So just let us know if you need anything like that for the future. All right, well, hopefully you all have a great evening. I know everybody lives in California, so it's a really nice weather today. So go enjoy the rest of your e evening. Um, so I'll see you all next, next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye everyone, thank you.